All right, welcome back to another lesson. So this lesson is going to be on documentation, communication, communication, documentation, same thing. So my name is Zach, and I'm going to be with you and sharing some information with you. I know you are in EMT school, whether you are a new, uh, soon-to-be EMT, or you are a vet going for a refresher class. So again, welcome. So today, let's get right into the lesson, and I just want to just introduce me, introduce you guys again to the bell. All right, once you hear the bell multiple times, that means that that is a very important thing to understand, and, you know, you might see that in the test, because there are millions and millions of questions, but there are certain questions as myself, as an instructor, teaching for almost two decades on certain things, and we know this is what you need to understand. And this is also important in the field. And I just wanted to make this as simple as possible. So if you hear that bell, we hear two bells. Boom, boom. Actually, it was the second bell twice. But if you hear two bells, that means deuces, we are out of here. I'm going to go to the next lesson. All right, deuces, we are out. So let's begin. And this is a very simple, pretty much one of my favorite um, presentations here. So let's go to documentations. And one thing I am going to say is, and I've said in previous uh, presentations, I said, please refer to your local or state protocols or regional protocols and policies because medicine changes. And when medicine changes, protocols changes. All right. Right now, I can say one thing and five years from now, it can change totally different. So I'm always going to refer back to your protocols because again it's your state all right it could be your procedure and it's different state by state so i'm just going to refer it that way all right so if you hear me say that that's the reason why let me um, cover this and let us begin to communicate now one of the things as an emt we always have to communicate the question is to who we have to communicate with well first your supervisor when you go into work your partner and your coworkers, and from there, your patients, bystanders, police officers, fire department, you're, you're talking to everybody. From there, you're gonna talk to, let's say, the hospital, presenting to the nurse, to the doctor. So there's a lot of communications, and you're gonna have different challenges as well when we have certain populations. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Then documentations is something that we will always write in forms, electronic form, paper forms, whether it's documentations in the office, in the station, or documentations right now today using more of a tablet or ePCRs, which is known as a PCR, patient care report. So we're going to look at some of those things and talk about different forms of communication as well as documentation. All right, so communication. Communication is important. We've been doing it for such a long time. Um, verbal is what people say. Then we also have the nonverbal. The nonverbal is like the body language. So body language is is key. It tells you at least 60% of the messages to the person. All right. So both those things are very crucial when it comes to communication, especially with our patients. So you know if they're in distress, you can tell if they're going to be aggressive. You can tell if they're even paying attention to you, or you can tell if they are paying attention to you. So body language is key. And communication with who? The patient, number two. The family. The family will call 911, all right? Not all cases, but some cases they will. And you have to communicate with them, all right? Other first responders. You're going to talk to police officers, firefighters, um, your supervisors. You might even be on the phone with, the, with the, the doctor, the online medical control. And also the hospital facilities, the providers there. All right. One of the things also, I mean, I'm recording from New York State, but within New York City, there's a melting pot. It's a big melting pot of cultures. OK, now you might be in a different state that you might not have as much diversity as here. But those these are things that you're going to have to take in consideration as far as the population, the areas that you're constantly working in. And you know it. All right. Once you work in an ambulance, this is your out. This is your area. You know your area in the back of your hand. But when you go into different metropolitan areas, there are different sections. You have the Hispanics, you have Asians, you have Africans, you have 
I mean, I can go on and on. Europeans, various different types. So there's a lot of cultural thing, all right? And one of the things in culture is like, what does it have to do with anything? Well, if you're staring at someone or looking directly eye to eye, in some cultures, that can be disrespectful. In other cultures where if you're not, you're looking around while you're talking, that's another sign of dis disrespectful, being, dis being, being disrespectful. Uh, what else? There are also areas of putting your hands in your pocket while you're talking. There's other, you know, that's a form of disrespect. So that, I'm just presenting this here because your patients, population, the culture is it's your, it's it's really how you present yourself, but at the same time being very respectful, as well as understanding people's cultures. And I've learned that a lot in this uh, this city here. <laughs> Let's move that here. All right, nonverbal communication, you have body language. The body tells you pretty much everything. The rolling the eyes, the certain types of facial expressions, um, movement, gestures. You have, you know, tapping on uh, the table or stomping your feet. So nonverbal cues is very valuable information rather than the language, but even put both together, you, you can see. And sometimes the language, uh, the verbal part of it, and in the body language can be two separate things, you know. And so just be mindful of what you see in front of you. And as an EMT, you're going to have to be very observant, all right? Be observant of the patient and how they're presenting themselves, as well as the family, the people around you, you know, even getting to the scene. You want to know if this could be a very hostile situation based on what you're seeing, based on the body language that's, that's suggested. All right, so that's a very important thing to 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 know. All right, another thing is that your own body language. <laughs> so not only the patients and the people that you're going to, but your body language has to be uh, the right language, you know, your posture, all right? And it's always important in these very chaotic situations to be very calm, very calm and very cool and very collective. And it's a very key thing because when people call, when people call 911, they're calling in distress. So when they call for distress, you know, there there's a lot of a lot of commotion that could happen, could happen. You know, that's that's happen all the time, but it could happen. And you have to be mindful how you send your language to everyone else. Good eye contact, it's good, not staring directly in the eyes, but that good eye contact, speak uh, speaking very calm and very slowly, because now you are the one that's so there's all saying is that you know you they call nine one one right for their emergency, so while you're going there, the emergency is still there. But once you reach to that scene, that scene, the emergency stops because you are there. Okay, you're in control now. Your training now is put into action, and for those who are not just coming onto this this uh, this. Uh, career or into becoming an EMT, this is something that's going to happen. You know, you get into some really situations, and that's the emergency. It doesn't matter what level it is, that's the emergency. Once you set foot in that scene, the emergency stops. You're in control now. All right. So, speaking calm, be cool, calm, collective, speak slowly, and don't, you know, give any threats and send those wrong um, body language to, to the family and also to staff, to everyone. All right, just be mindful of what language you're speaking. All right, so within the the the, the this these uh, factors of being in different environments. All right, noise is anything that dampers the true meaning of a message. You know, I have a couple of pictures here. One is a subway system. All right, can definitely bring a lot of noise. Uh, lighting, if it's a dark club, you, you never know. You'd be responding to a nightclub or specific locations where it's very dark. Distance can play a part and the environment. So those factors are important to keep in mind, you know, that these, these the environments, the physical factors in communicating can also damper, dampen the the forms of getting those messages across. Moving forward, we have something called getting those details. All right. In order for you to get details in communication, you have to have something called open end questions. Open end questions will follow with the W's. All right. Example, what is 
bothering you or what's bothering you. So the W is actually going to be opening the door to hear all these different things that's bothering the patient. Close-in questions are very short and direct. So for example, what position is this? Good. This is the tripod position. This is telling me, looking at me, <laughs> that this is a sign of distress, respiratory distress specifically. All right. So single word answers, yes or no. Are you having trouble breathing? Yes or no. And the reason why you're doing the close end question approach is because they can't breathe. They're speaking in complete sentences, all right? They're in distress in this particular case. So are you having trouble breathing? And they're either going to say yes or they're going to say no. All right, in the, in the process of interviewing your patients when you approach them, it's all about the touch or how you touch the patients. One thing I can say is you want to avoid touching their face or in the chest, especially if they're conscious, all right? If you're checking lung sounds and anytime you are assessing anything, anything, anything in their space, you have to inform them what you're gonna do rather than just doing it, all right? So just be mindful on touching their face, unless you're gonna be palpating, which means to touch and assessing in an appropriate way. Now we're really de dealing with more of an inappropriate, all right? We're, we're something that we wanna avoid those areas, be mindful of those areas, okay? Especially with all populations, okay? So those are the things. When it comes to touching and assessing, now if the patient's unresponsive critical care and you're going to have to get it, get down and, and do what you have to do, and we spoke more on that during um, patient assessment, all right? So avoid the face and the chest. So these are some things you want to avoid. So here it is, false reassurance all right so now let's give you an example someone's doing cpr on a patient family member said hey is he going to be okay I'm like yeah he'll be fine no he's not going to be fine so i just gave a false reassurance so we're saying the better way to say it is we're doing the best that we can do at this time all right talking too much all right you talk so much that you're you're not getting information not listening so they say we have one mouth two ears so we have two ears so we're going to listen a little more especially when it comes to these type of emergency, because as we're talking, we're probably missing a lot of other things, other informations. Or interrupting, where someone starts talking, you just boom, start interrupting their what they're saying. So allow the patients, especially the, 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 uh, the geriatric population or patients that need some time to articulate what they're saying. So give them some, some time. Don't constantly interrupt them, but based on the population, you know the strategies on communicating with them. So again, um, you're looking at family, friends, and bystanders. So friends that will call, they happen to be on the scene, calling for them or being there. Again, be mindful how you you send your communication towards them, as well as family members. They're very concerned. So you want to really try your best to bring down the anxiety level. Okay, bystanders as well. They're going to be nosy. They're going to be around, they probably call, they just want, and now we're living in a society we have phones, all right? So again, things are being recorded. So just keep that in mind. Well, communication, basic one-on-one -on -one is getting good eye contact. Get a good eye contact with your patient. Tell them the truth. Tell them what's really happening. Tell them that, you know, we need to get you to the hospital. If you don't, you know, you can get worse, all right? Use simple language. No medical terminologies in a sense. Yeah, be mindful of the medical terminologies. Be mindful of using like those 10 codes or, you know, things that's just unfamiliar because this is our language, all right? But now when you talk to the when you talk to the civilian world, they won't understand what we're saying anyway. So just be mindful of that and give the right communication with your body language, all right? Also speak very slow and clear. All right, so they can understand what you're doing, what's happening. Allow the patients to answer the questions. You ask the question, let them answer it. And just be cool, calm, and very collective and very confident. And confidence comes with more time, with experience. Um, when you start off, if you're new to this, it's going to you know, feel very uncertain about certain things. So, but as time goes on, your experience, you get more calls, more years on, it becomes like nothing. All right, older population or older patients, we want to identify ourselves. 
All right. Get that good communication going. Get that eye contact. All right. Don't assume they might be older. And maybe they, they can hear very well. They're very sharp nowadays, right? So don't assume that they can't hear. Don't assume anything. Because I say this to my class is that dealing, working uh, along or 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 responding to the elderly, responding to older patients, responding to the geriatric patients, these individuals have been something of value and been of value from the past time. Some of them could have been doctors, some of them could have been teachers, some of them have been, you know, uh, retirees, uh, retired first responders. You know, they're a society of people with, so we have to give them that respect, you know, with all our patients, but specifically here. Give them some time to ask, answer your questions that you give them. So give them time to process that. Also be aware of confusion if there are. They might have some type of uh, dementia. Or if they have any hearing aids, you can check the dresser or the counter or places you might find it. And also glasses, if you see glasses or they might be visually impaired. So be mindful of that. Children, all right, once we to the elderly, older, now we're going to the children. They can definitely be frightened. Why? Because either they got hurt, they feel sick, and they're not understanding that. Now you're coming in with, the radio is loud and you're coming with a whole bunch of people here. There might be uh, five people coming in on the scene. So over, overall, they're going to be very scared or very frightened. So your job is to calm them down, you know, give them, the, just bring all that anxiety down. Calm voice, reassuring, build that rapport. You know, if they have their favorite toys or dolls or even favorite blanket, let them bring it. All right, let them bring it with them because it's going to make them feel well. So reassure them. Gain their confidence. Let them have confidence in you. All right? Maintain good eye contact. Now, if you if they are sitting down or in a particular level, you're going to go to eye level. Maintain. You're going to go to their level so they can feel more com uh, comfortable. Hearing impaired, we also have uh, those situations where you might find the hearing aid in the ear, be mindful. You might also find it on the dresser. Maybe it's not working. Maybe the batteries are out. Maybe there's a lot of reasons. So be very prepared to be observant. I say that the emergency medical technician is the most observant people out there because we have to look for the clues and seeing what's really happening. So one of the different techniques that we can use in communicating with them is lip reading. All right, I know someone very well that when we do talk, he has to look at my lips. He hears me, but he the reading my lips, he's able to understand better. He's much uh, older. Hearing aids, uh, pen and paper can also be a form of communication towards the hearing impaired. Now, with hearing impaired, it might, it might be certain levels. Right? It might be extreme. It might just be one ear or both, okay? Or you just have to be mindful of the level. That's all. The next is the hearing impairment. We have some sign languages here. We've got uh, this EMT here giving some certain uh, sign language of sit, being sick, being hurt, and also help. All right, so these are just different types of sign languages towards the hearing impaired. Um, now we have the visually impaired. Explain everything that you're doing because they're not there. Now, one thing I can say about the hearing impairment and the visual impaired is that statistically they found that they are most uh, the population has been victimized out there you know due to their disability so now you're coming you have to reassure them identify who you are you know make them have the confidence to know that you're there to help them okay they don't know what's really happening so explain everything that you're doing and guide them through the process all right so if you're going to, let's say, walk them to the ambulance, right? Let's just say that's one of the scenarios. You want to make sure that they're holding on to you and you're guiding them to the ambulance. All right. Don't just tell them, just go straight ahead and you find it. No, you have to guide them. Let them hold on to you, your elbow. You will find um, guide dogs there. All right. You'll have harnesses. You have also um, something labeled as a guide door or surface dog. 
and you could transport the dog with the patient. All right. But again, you can find what your state protocol states, you know, your policy and procedures, but transporting the dog with them, that's, that's, that's there, that's the owner. And these dogs have been uh, trained to deal with these non-English speaking patients. Um, I, again, I'm in New York city. So in New York city, we have the melting pot. So I've dealt with situations where there was a totally completely different language and in some areas some systems have translators some people some systems have um, cards that have pictures that you can kind of communicate with them with that or family friends they can also help to interpret communicating with the healthcare professionals it gives a report to the staff Okay, you have to give the report to the staff, especially the, the triage nurse when you're bringing your patients in. That's a given. That's a given, given, given. So just, you know, give the complaint to the nurse. You can give them the name and uh, illness or injuries and whatever history and vital signs that's presented, and you can take it from there with you know with the uh, with the patient. So that's that now goes into bringing and passing that important information to the other. Um, hospital staff. It's mainly the triage nurse, and from there to the doctor. Documentation. So every patient care um, contact we make, we have to present a patient care report or EPCR. All right, that's what it means. Patient care report, PCR. Now, is a continuity of care. It's a legal document. We use it for educational use. Administrative. All right, they do quality improvement. They can check uh, statistics and things like that and find ways to improve the services, treatments, and part of the patient's record. All right, so we're going to find the chief complaint. This is a paper PCR here, if you can see to the right. It's the chief complaint. We spoke about that earlier in previous lectures. This is the main complaint of the patient. Vital signs, all right? We've got two, three sets of vital signs here and your assessment. We're going to talk about more on documentation here. All right, so administrative information. All right, so basically, you're going to add some other stuff, basically um, assigned to the job, all right, which some codes is different in state to state, region to region. So they're going to be asking, well, this is the time you was assigned a call. I was going to give you not, um, codes, but again, codes can change. Codes are different. Uh, there's a call even for being on the scene and even at the hospital and being available. So these are all based on the administrative information there. And this is important too, because it tells you how long the unit has been on this particular job. How, did they, how long did it take them to get there? How long they've been on the scene? How long they've been in the hospital uh, and available for the next call? Because there's a lot of different scenarios given. So let's just say, you're assigned to a specific job, and you're in the city. There might be a traffic jam. There might be a rush, uh, what's that, rush hour. So it might take you a while to get there. Number two, you're on the scene. All right, maybe the location of finding a patient might be extended. All right, or a trauma call can be extended or it can just be quick. We want to we want, we want to know exactly what's really happening. This is good data. That's going to help for quality improvement as far as response time. At the hospital, you might get to the hospital. It is busy, right? There's no stretchers. And those who know, right? You work the field. There's no stretchers. Or, you know, so you might be extended waiting for a stretcher. All right. And from the time on, you might have to do some cleaning up. You might have to restock. All right. It, 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 so being available for the next call. Because, you know, again, there's certain equipment they're going to need. We'll talk about that later on in operations that you need for the ambulance or service to provide this care to them, to your patients. So there's some narratives in this PCR. We have narrative section, this is called chart. So within this, this is a good way to help documentation is the chief complaint, what the patient complained of, as well as the history, what was going on, what's their medical history, and what did you do for them? What was the assessment? And what was the treatment? And what was what your findings in your treatments? What did you do? What type of medication? What type of interventions? Right. And last but not least, T is transport. So C is uh, chief complaint. H is the history. 
A is assessment, R is uh, treatment, and T is transport. And we have one more. There it is, SOAP, right? SOAP is always good to have. It's a subject, subject, subjective, and we have interview. That's the interview part of it. Then we have O, which is objective, is the assessment. And we have the A is also assessment and also the presumptive diagnosis. And P is the plan of action. What did you do? What was your response? You know, so the SOAP and chart are some basic guidelines. I mean, can you, it's different um, mnemonics and stuff or different ways to present your narrative and documentation. Also, some other things you want to have in your narrative is the time and event. You want to go into your assessments. Uh, what did you find? What type of treatment? What type of care? As well as your final patient disposition. Was it an RMA, refused medical attention? Was it um, transport with ALS or paramedics? You know, so there's a lot of different uh, things that can happen, but this is a basic the basic, basic stuff in your narrative when it comes to the story. All right, another thing is here, avoid your radio codes. Don't be judgmental. All right, your, your professional confidentiality or being, uh, it's important. Falsification, immediately we are not tolerating that because that's um, big, big trouble. So you never want to falsify any, any kind of do documentation. And if you do have an error, especially if you're writing, you can cross it out with one line and put an initial if you're writing. But you're not now. We're in a technology world. Most places are using tablets. So you could just backspace and then correct it. But in, in, in case you do have any uh, documentation, you can know uh, that you're writing. You can just cross it out, initial, and that's it. Now I'm going to move over to uh, communication. So communication simple. This is the way of getting that help if we need that real communication because you're going to be out there in the streets all right you're going to be wherever it is the urban you know wherever you're going to be you're going to be out there all right and you and your partner or partners so we're going to rely on the radio all right portable radios we have portable radios is with the ones that we carry then we have onboard radio and also the dispatch radio but for us out there in the field, we're going to have our portable radio or our onboard. So the communication that's out there is basically three things. Number one is the radio. Two is the telephone and um, lifeline. So these are things that all help in the communication pro process. So base station radios is very simple. It's a base, base station contains a transmitter as well as a receiver in a fixed particular place. All right, this is, the, this is the base. Now, there are two-way radios consist of a transmitter and receiver. So this is uh, where the dispatcher will give out that call. And these radios will be given out to the units. And this is where that communication will come between the two while they're out in the field. Mobile is installed inside the ambulance, right? And that communication is directly to the dispatcher, all right? Handheld, all right, basically you're going to hold it, you know, or they have the microphones. That's communication with the dispatcher as well as with other ambulances and also with certain channels. You can actually call the medical control and speak to the doctors. Repeater systems or repeater base systems is special base radio st um, station radios. And so, so we have the base radio here. And basically, it receives the messages and frequency of one, one frequency. All right. So it receives the message, right, the signal on that one frequency. So we have the ambulance here. That signal comes here and goes into another antenna. So automatically retransmits, right, automatically retransmits to get to that communication here. So even though up, if we look on the sky, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of uh, transmissions happening. All right, so we're going to have to allow two mobile or portable units that cannot reach each other directly to communicate using a greater power or antenna to, to get this information right across the repeater base system. Now, we also have the hardware. The hardware, we have two-way radios. So we have the simplex, which is you just 
press to talk and then to release you have to release it to listen so talk 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 release now I'm able to listen the duplex which is the simultaneously talking and listening a multiplex is utilizing one or two types of frequencies the MDT the mobile data terminal is where again this is what it's used out there now all right it's a computer but you have all the information that will go into the call all right I know for those who works you know right now you don't want to see this right now you're a refresher class you know you want to take a little break right so but for those who are new this is basically you know the driver's side here this is the passenger side the driver drives usually the emt will look at the information actually both will you look at the information of the location the time the complaint and what's really happening this is a good form of communication all right with all this radio stuff it has to go through the FCC. What does the FCC stand for? It is the Federal Communications Commission. All right, they're the ones that allocate all the radio frequencies, licenses, as well as uh, monitor radio operations. They monitor it. They do. They do make sure there's nothing inappropriate. There's nothing, you know, that it's 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 being monitored at all times. All right. So let's say we get to the hospital. Now we have in this communication using. Um, documentation we already said in the communication so now we get to the going to the hospital you have to do a notification to the hospital so we have to give the unit six six boy you know we are we have a uh, 23 year old male uh chief complaint of gunshot wound and we have vital signs are and patients you know patients been stabilized and the eta estimate time of arrival is two three minutes all right so that will be just a basic um notification you, you you specifically say your unit your the the patient do not give the name you don't have to give all that information just enough where it protects the patient's information and enough for the hospital to receive them and be ready for them for their interventions and the treatments with the patient report, again, chief complaint was what the person complained of, their findings, their treatments, and that's it. And with medical control, offline medical control, we covered this before, offline is protocols, standing orders. Online protocol, online medical control is when you're directly speaking to the doctor. So treatment transport, all right? If, remember we said, if you're not really sure, you call a medical director. All right, online. Then let's say they give you a specific um, order. Okay, give medication or transport patient or whatever they give you. Key thing, repeat orders back word for word and then confirm it with the doctor. Because again, we don't want miscommunication. And when the doctor gives you a report, then you say, okay, doctor, such and such. You're saying you want me to go boop, 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 and that's, and he says, correct. Got it. So the, end, the, the communication is very clear. All right. So I hope that this presentation was able to help you to get some things a little clearer. Let me just uh, stop sharing. So I hope you guys uh, got something from this. So continue to study until the next lesson. Again, under the description, you can hit that. I have a few... Um, resource some books that you can um, get that's going to help you some practice tests and also some uh, quick good stuff so just check out the description below and until i see you on the next one have a good one and continue to study and be the great emt you soon to be and those who are there continue to save lives all right have a good one